Hey, welcome back to We Build, We Learn. My name is Daniel, and I am super excited about today's project. Uh, it's a long time coming, and well, I'm happy that we're finally doing it. When I built my shack, I ran LMR 400 from my tower to right here in the shack, and I did six runs. But there's a little bit of an oversight in my haste to get going and operating on my radio. I put the connectors on the end, and I just hooked everything up. But as I started to build up my, my furniture, I realized that the LMR 400 wouldn't do for my final connection. You see, LMR 400 is a great low loss cable, except for it has limitations on its turning radius. This manufacturer specifies a one-time radius of four inch. Now that's still pretty tight for this type of cable, but if you can do it, that's great. But the problem is that here at my, my station, uh, I like to move my radios in and out and adjust things. And unfortunately, as you do that, you start to wear and tear on your coax. So this is not a good long-term solution and I need to find something that's gonna make me be able to move around my rigs, pull them out, put them back in, especially to get the most clearance on my workstation that's possible. So what I've decided to do is to make a patch panel. Now a patch panel is simply a piece of wood or anything that has connectors, specifically for me is gonna be these bulkhead connectors and that allows me to have my feed line come in and then I can hook up some patch cables to it to go right to my rig. Now, initially I thought about doing it in wood, but then I realized that I had a great opportunity to include some RF grounding into my coax cables. So before we get into talking about RF grounding, let's take a look at the design process, where I came from and what I decided on, and then we'll come back and talk about material selection and RF grounding as a whole. My initial concept was to use a piece of wood that I can simply drill and add some chassis connector. Now, this would be easy and it would also allow me to finish it in any finish that I wanted to, to match my shack and go good with the overall design of the shack. But quickly I realized that I had the opportunity to incorporate some RF grounding. So I changed from wood to an aluminum plate. Now, Aluminum plate works well for this application, but the problem here is with the chassis mount connectors. I would have to solder all my coax to the back of these connectors. And quite honestly, it was laborsome and I wasn't really interested to do that. So I changed to my final design, which would be using bulkhead connectors. Now, this also allowed me to tap the holes so that I can actually thread my bulkhead connector into the aluminum and not just rely on the compression from the two nuts on either side. So like I said, we're gonna be using aluminum to build my patch panel plate. And I'm pretty sure I know what some of you are saying. Dan, you should be using copper. Copper is a better conductor than aluminum. Why aren't you using copper? And you're right. There's no denying the fact that copper is a better conductor than aluminum. Aluminum is roughly 61% the conductivity of copper. Now, there is a variable in which we're not gonna to discuss today, and that is the specific alloy in which you're using for your aluminum plate. But with the idea of roughly 61% the conductivity of copper, we need to understand that the conductivity is based on the material resistance. Copper has a lower resistance than aluminum. So much like in our house wiring, we overcome the resistance by increasing the gauge. By increasing the thickness of our material, we can reduce the resistance. And thus, we can have an equivalent in a thicker gauge. If I look at the material that's on the market that's available, specifically pre-made patch panels, they're anywhere between a sixteenth of an inch and an eighth of an inch. So with my quarter inch aluminum plate, I calculate that I'm roughly just under three sixteenths of an inch equivalent in copper. Now, if we wanna calculate for some margin of error, let's bring it down to an eighth of an inch copper. And that is a sufficient product in order to use for this. Now, if I look at another option that I have, specifically using quarter inch aluminum, I can actually increase my mechanical connection to a better connection than if I was to use a thin piece of material. I purchased a 5H24 tap. And using this 5H24 tap, I can not only drill the holes, but instead of having my connection be just a compression connection that my bulkhead connector does, I can actually have a fully threaded hole that increases my surface area of contact between my bulkhead connector and my plate. Now let's talk about the RF grounding component of this project. Initially, this was only supposed to be a patch panel, 
a place where the coax from outside can come in and transition to a different coax that was better suited for moving things around in my shack, something I wouldn't have to worry too much about the wear and tear on the coax itself. Now, there is an added benefit that I have an opportunity to create some RF grounding, but if it's not done right, I could cause problems in my shack, including ground looping. Now, RF noise in your shack can wreak havoc on not only your equipment, but severely impact your operating experience. So having the opportunity to try and deal with that, we might as well take advantage of it. It's important to realize that grounding is a system. It's not about one single component, but each component can make a big impact on their overall system. Is that confusing? Well, very simply, if you go to the store and you buy a piece or component or you order online, It'd be foolish to consider that that one component is your whole system. It's the same thing with lightning protection. It's the same thing with grounding. And for a whole slew of things, even outside of amateur radio. So you need to do your own research and come to your own understanding of how grounding in your shack and grounding at your tower and everything works together. For me, this patch panel is only one component in a series of components that create my overall system. So with all that behind us, let's head to the shop and let's build this patch panel. Aluminum and copper are both really easy materials to cut and you can cut them with some pretty basic tools. I'm cutting it with a table saw, but you can use a chop saw, you can use a skill saw, and several other tools to do it. The most important thing is to work safe. Now, I plan on putting this on a CNC router to make some marks, and I just need to make sure that I can secure it down well, and that's why I'm marking these holes, so that I can secure it down with some screws to the CNC nesting bed. If you need to be super precise with your hole location, one way you can achieve this is by center punching the hole and then you can rotate the drill bit backwards while it's sitting on the top of the hole. This will allow things to drift into place and center up your drill bit with your hole position. What I'm doing now is adding a countersink to the hole. A countersink is a chaffer that goes around the perimeter of the hole that allows for the screw head to be recessed below the surface of the finished product. This can also be achieved with a regular drill bit. So now that our holes are lined up, and yeah, they line up beautifully, uh, we can add screws into the corners to secure this down so it doesn't move when we're machining it. So let's get... Now this is secure. Now this is a vacuum bed and in, in case you didn't know, the way this works is that this is a piece of MDF. MDF has like a, a finish on top of it so we machine it down in order to allow the air to come through. So these are little plug holes in here. There's a gasket that allows us to uh, change the pattern in which we have our uh, spoil board is what we call it. And uh, underneath here, all the holes are open. There's a gasket around, and we surface the face of it. It usually takes about nine, nine thou to get rid of the sort of wax coating on it. And we flip it over, and we do that again, and it becomes very, very porous. So the vacuum pressure that's created by the vacuum pump comes right through this panel and secures everything down uh, right to the sheet so that we can cut and process it. The problem is that I have a small surface area here, so a lot of my air pressure, my vacuum pressure, is gonna be escaping through here. So I'm gonna add some pieces of wood or some material on here, so I can try and cover up as much of the um, this table with uh, something to uh, create a suction on it, so I don't lose too much air pressure. Because if I lose too much uh, air pressure, vacuum pressure, whatever you wanna call it, um, when I go to cut this, I can actually move the whole spoil board off of its base, off of its, its uh, gasket, and that causes a big problem. So I'm going to throw down some pieces of material here, and then we're going to get cutting.
now that we've drilled all the holes, we added a little bit of a chamfer around the edge or a countersink, whatever you want to call it. That just is going to help the tap to go in because of the type of tap it is. And so what we want to do is we want to go in nice and straight, perpendicular to the surface and both axes. And then we're going to just tap it slowly. We might use some oil on it, some, uh, some lube in order to take care of that. And then let's do one hole and we'll see what it looks like. So that chamfer we put on the hole really helps to line it up and uh, let's see how we did there. We're going to blow a little bit of the air into there to clean out any of the chips that we have in the thread. This goes in nice and tight. So this itself, the barrel has its own connection besides for the, um, the two nuts that we're going to put on each side, which is just going to be a lot better than if it was floating in a, in a loose hole. So let's get all the rest of these holes tapped and then we get to put it all together. All right, guys, I am super happy with the results of this project, and uh, I think it looks phenomenal. It is a little overkill. I only have six coax coming into my shack right now. I do plan to add some more in the future. I have a couple more antennas I want to put up, and I also have beverage antennas that I'm going to be building this summer. But to be honest with you, there are some better options than running all designated coax in the shack. There is also the option of an antenna switch out in the field. And maybe that's something we're going to work on in the future coming up. Uh, like I said, we did incorporate our grounding lugs here. And uh, there are some other thoughts that I have about this patch panel for another project in the future that would bring this to the next level. And I'm still working on that concept as a whole. But I am learning in the same time as I'm doing this. And I would greatly appreciate some feedback. If you have any comments or some resources for me to look at, I would greatly appreciate that. And I would encourage you to leave it in the comment section below and let's start a discussion. But thank you for joining me today in this project build and I look forward to seeing you on the next one.